we're still in 1 Corinthians. We come to 1 Corinthians 13, and all of you know what 1 Corinthians 13 is all about, right? It's, it's the way of love. It's, it's 1 Corinthians, it's there. Mostly what we do, we use it at weddings. You know, I do it in all my weddings. I come to the place, I said, now I join upon you uh, the love that is written in the scriptures, and I, I quote the scripture. And then, I don't know, do we really expect anybody to actually do it? Do anybody actually say, okay, this is the way I'm going to love my wife. This is the way I'm going to love my husband. This passage of Scripture is placed right in the middle of the spiritual that he's talking about. And what he did is he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31b is what, what that should be. I was in 13, and so 13 came to mind, and I didn't correct it. It's I'm corrected on my paper, but it's not corrected there. So on your papers, it says 13. Change that to 12, 31. It says this, and I show you a still more excellent way. The spiritual is great. The Spirit of God dwells within us, enabling us to do the things that empowering us to live the Christian life. That is a marvelous thing. But he says, I got an even more excellent way for you. Because what they were doing is they were messing up with the good way that God had given them with the power of the Holy Spirit, and they were patting themselves on the back and saying, see what I got? I got this gift, and I'm going to show it forth, all this, all this, look at this, look at this, look at this. And what they're actually saying is, look at me, look at me, look at me. He said, I'm going to tell you a more excellent way to live life. And this is, Paul interrupts this discussion of the spiritual to give you some other understanding. And so he starts off with this passage of Scripture. It's amazing. He says, If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Where does he get that terminology, you wonder? I wonder where he gets that terminology. Well, it is noisy. It's, it, you, know, they, you speak all these different languages. You know, nobody understands. It's just, and nobody understands cymbals or, or noisy gongs. It doesn't communicate uh, words to us so you could get it from there but I think it's something more than that because I think he might be remembering to a time when he didn't have love in his heart it was a time when Barnabas came to him and he and Barnabas were planning a, a new missionary journey and Barnabas says let's take John Mark with us and Paul goes no he failed me he left he left this place he didn't do it. What do I hear? <laughs> it's not going to happen. You're not going to do this. And Bar Bar Barnabas says, but, but God, this, this is John Mark. He's my, my relative, and, and I believe in him. I think God has some big things for him, and we got to take him along so we can grow in Christ. But Paul's heart was hard toward John Mark because he left Paul. And he couldn't see the love of God. And so he became a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal as he and Barnabas yelled at each other that night. And they got so heated that they split and they didn't went in separate directions. And as far as we know, they never got back together again. I think maybe he was remembering that there was a time in his life where he needed to hear what he was speaking of here. If I speak with tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Here, what are you going? Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I got all the theology in the world. I know what I'm doing. I, I know the truth. If I have no love, I am nothing. I had an experience back at a minister's Bible study. And in that Bible study, I was, I was trying to make a point. I was saying, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, he studied Christianity for a while, and he loved the teachings of Jesus. He loved the teachings of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, this guy just blew up and he started attacking me 
because I used the name Mahatma Gandhi, and he, was, he had a, an opinion of his opinion that, that Christians were lifting up Mahatma Gandhi. I'm sorry, Mahatma Gandhi is probably in hell right now. That's from me, okay? He, you know, we understand the scripture. If he didn't come to Christ and Christ didn't save him, then he's lost. I'm not lifting up Mahatma Gandhi. But the reason why Mahatma Gandhi is probably in hell is because he heard the teaching of Jesus, saw the beauty of the teaching of Jesus, loved the teachings of Jesus, but he looked at Christian people and he says, if the followers of Jesus don't do what Jesus said, then I don't want anything to do with Christianity. And he turned back to his Hinduism and was lost. These words that are spoken here need to go beyond just speaking them in a marriage ceremony. You need to see them clearly that this is the calling of God for us to live this life. That love of love. And we, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we'll see as we preach through this, are called to this type of love that the world may see that it is real for us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, and if I give my possession to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Okay, all right, so we know that. What love is he talking about? Well, there, I'm sure you've heard the three loves. You've probably been in church long enough to hear the three loves. There's, there's the eros love. If I, I love you if. I love you if you please me. I love you if you do this, if you do this, whatever it is. I love you as long as you're loving me. I love you. But as soon as that changes, my love is gone. The Bible doesn't even mention Eros. It shows Eros. You can see it in David and Bathsheba. You can see it in Solomon. You can see it all through the Scripture. You can see Eros in the Scripture, but it never names it in the New Testament and never uses that word. It is of the flesh, totally and completely. It's useful in marriage but it is not useful in public life. Phileo, I love you because. I love you because you're my brother. I love you because you're my sister. I love you because you're, you're related to me. I love you, whatever because is out there. Because we go to church together, I love you. But you change the circumstances, and then all of a sudden my love is gone. And we see that happening all the time. And then there's the agape love you. I love you, period. Just Flat out, period. That's it. I love you. It doesn't matter what you do or how you do it. This is the love of God for people like you and I who have misused and abused our life in this world. And yet God still sent his son Jesus to die for us. And Jesus says that all manner of sin shall be forgiven because I pay it all. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, my blood will be able to cover you and you'll be able to stand in the presence of God. I'll make you in such a way that God is favorable to you. That's a propitiation. He's made God favorable to us by the blood that he shed for us. It's the love of God that we find when for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die for us. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we believe on this Jesus and we receive this agape love from God. So what do we do with it? Well, here's Paul defines this agape love a little bit closer for us, that we can understand what God is talking about, why he loved us, and the way we are to love each other. As God has forgiven us, so also we forgive our brothers in Christ the same way. So it's only through the love that God gives to us in the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to do this. But listen to what he says. He says love is patient. Here we go. Love is patient. I'm willing to wait for a change in a person's life. I've told you this story of my friend. Whenever I shared Christ with him, he came to Christ. But he had been involved with drugs. And he came out of the drugs. And then after he walked and grew a little bit more in Christ, he left that and went back and started doing another thing that was not right before God. He was delivered from that. We persistently worked with him. We didn't throw him away because he went back. He turned his back on the calling that God gave to him. 
And he came out of that. And then it wasn't too long before he was back into drugs again. And I set him on a, the hood of his car and I talked to him one night and I said, I don't care if you go to hell. I will go in after you. As many times as you go there, I will go after you. Years later, my father had just died. My stepfather had died. On the same day, without knowing that my stepfather died, he called me on the phone. I needed great encouragement, and he encouraged me that day. And he said, you know, John, I'm a different man now because you came after me. And I'm walking with the Lord. And I'm, I'm calling you because I'm in this evangelism course. And they said, you ought to call somebody that made a difference in your life. Don't get many calls like that. But it's what I needed. Love is patient. We're willing to go the distance for each other. And to believe that no matter where a person goes, that they can come back out of that hole and get back with God, no matter what. My daughter was there. And I had to die daily knowing my daughter wasn't walking with the Lord. But she's coming back. She's got a long ways to go. But no matter where she goes, I'm going to love her. And I'm going to believe in her. And that's what this is about. Love is kind. I like those t-shirts kids are wearing them. Kindness. They've got kindness shirts out there. How about that? That's good. Love is kind. The scripture, Old Testament, what does God require of you? What does God require of you? And one of the things it says is you love kindness. Love to be kind to one another. Love to care for one another. That person who makes a mess of their life who says the wrong thing, who is, is arrogant or whatever it may be, learn to be kind. Not to be jealous. What is a jealousy? Jealousy is looking at another person and wanting what they have. And being angry at that person because they have what you have. And God calls us to love. And I don't have a choice here in the matter of who it is that I love. If you're in Christ, I love you. If you say that you're in Christ and act like you don't walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't say, well, you then I don't have to love you. No, you say you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I love you anyway. Because we all get to that place where there's something wrong with us. And we need to have the stalwart love of the church that will go to hell for us to win us back to Christ. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. What do we have that is not given to us from God? There is humility in this love. It is never a place where I have and you don't. It's never where we have that thing on there. I am so and so and you're not. I am this, I'm near not. It's never a place for that. But if a person is lacking, then we are there for them to build them up, to strengthen them, to encourage them, to build them into who they need to be. I've seen this happen so many times when people in the church expect something out of somebody and they fail them and then so no longer will I work with you. No longer will I work with you. No longer do I have... You, you failed me. Instead of looking at how can I present this person back to God more holy and more complete, it is, oh, you failed me. There you're gone. That's arrogance. That's almost saying, I will never fail anybody. And you know that person's going to fail. Do they want to be thrown away either? No. Let's do what is right. It doesn't act unbecomingly. I'm not sure exactly. <clears throat> you know, 
you've got you've all been very nice to me and you said oh john you can wear anything you want you know but am i unbecoming because i don't wear a tie in some minds i would be but i say it's not about comfort and the reason why i'm doing this of changing my tact changing my tie for a <laughs> uh, i don't know a hawaiian shirt or whatever maybe it's not because well it is because i hate ties but it, it's not because I hate ties. It's because I care about people. And if it matters, if you look around, most of you don't wear ties. And so if it matters that you're sitting there and saying, well, you know, in order to be a good Christian guy, you got to wear a tie. And uh, I mean, if you, not, not a good Christian guy in the sense of that, but in the sense of being a, a preacher, you got to wear a tie. And I don't want a tie, so I'll never be a preacher. That's silliness. If you want some, I, I want people to know there's a God in heaven that loves them. And clothing doesn't matter to him. What matters is a heart that is in love with his father and with his people. Is not provoked. <laughs> Here's another story. Last week, uh, duty came and got me. I was in, in in my little cubicle there, working on on whatever I do out there. And she said, "There's that this company has called us, and and we're behind two months in in payments." I went, "No, we're not two months behind in payments." I got on the phone, and they provoked me. <laughs> I got caught up in this thing. Eventually, Judy says, "I think it's a scam." In my mind, it took me a while to un disengage from my being provoked, but I was provoked. And then after I hung up, I, well, finally I got to the place of saying, well, they were going to cut off our power if we didn't go down to a, an ATM and give them two months of back pay. And uh, that's dumb. I should have recognized that almost to begin with. You know, but they, they were pretty clever about it. And I think they intended to provoke you because they, in that type of a scamming, they get you so upset that you just do what they say. But I finally said to him, well, I guess we're just going to have to have you turn off for power, and I hung up on him. But I, afterwards, I started thinking, I didn't love those people. They provoked me, and my love didn't come through. I, I thought afterwards, what I should have said to him was, you know, if you're scamming people like you're doing here, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> That's not loving either. <laughs> That's, that's not it. It crossed my mind that I should have said that. But, you know, to say to him, you know, you're going to stand before a God who's going to judge you someday. And you're going to have to answer for what you've done. But I know a way out. I know a way out. I know Jesus. That he'll forgive you if you turn away from your sin now. But I didn't love him enough to do that. That's kind of sad. But if I loved them, I wouldn't have been provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered. Now, this is a tough one for us, isn't it? Somebody has hurt us. Somebody has damaged us. Do I love them enough to let it go? Do I love them enough to let it go? Do I constantly look to see what I can do to overcome this wrong and make that person more like Christ as a result of my interaction with them? How to do that. So, he goes on to say, does not rejoice in unrighteousness. That's understandable. It doesn't rejoice when somebody does something wrong and they're going to get it. You know, they're going to get their comeuppance. You know, that's rejoicing with unrighteousness is what you do. No. Oh, no. They're falling off a cliff. They need to be saved. Oh, my goodness. Somebody, including me, reach out and grab them before they fall. But rejoices in the truth. Rejoices in the truth. Wow. There's a great joy when somebody who has walked away from Jesus comes back to Jesus. I have a great joy in my heart. 
It bears all things. That means puts up with all things. Forbearing with one another. Put up with each other. Make a place for each other. Yeah, I know you're an idiot. But there's a place for idiots in my life. Don't do that. But, you know, there's a place. I, do I love you enough to lay my knife down for you, even if we don't have this click? There's, there's, there's personalities. You come across them. It's like somebody taking their fingers on a chalkboard and going down. You know, you're, you're, oh, I can't handle this personality. Yes, you can if you love them. It believes all things. In spite of what it looks like that person's doing, I believe in them. I believe in God, and I believe that God is in them, and I believe that God can do anything they want with them. You know, Paul was a persecutor of the church. He was destroying the church as far as he was concerned. He wanted to destroy the people that were in the church. And God turned his heart around in a moment. So, also... As we love people into the kingdom of God, God doesn't leave us the same as what we were when we started. And people who are loved learn to love. And we start teaching people to love. And when they love, then they also turn around and love others as well and love things out of people. I had this friend of mine in, Cal in Montana. He wrote me a little, a little letter and he said, I've been learning from you, John. I've been learning how you love things out of people. And I didn't know whether that's what I actually did or what I was doing, but I sure wanted that to be true about me, that I wanted to be a man who loved things out of people, not demanded them, not cajoled them, not to condemn them, not to make sure that they do every, absolute everything right, but actually love them. It hopes all things, endures all things. Amazing stuff that love does. The thing it concludes with is love never fails. It never fails. It is always going to be successful. When I was talking about the things when we, with the weaker brother that we, we take care of that weaker brother, I had a minister friend of mine who says, oh yeah, the the tyranny of the weaker brother. As if he could negate chapter 13 in just a quickly thing. If I love this person like this, they'll take advantage of it. Well, yes, it is possible for a person to take advantage. We have people coming into the church all the time looking for handouts and things that they can help them, and they're taking advantage of our love. I, I understand that, but we're going to love them anyway. And if a person comes in the door that says, I'm hungry, we're going to feed them whether they've got a pantry full of food or not. My dad, my stepdad, he was delivering things at Christmas time to people that, that were in need. And so they came to this one house and they knocked on the door and, and somebody hollered, come on in. And they came in with a box of, of good food for them. And they, and they saw, oh, oh, well, just put it with the other stuff over there. And my dad got really upset and wouldn't do that anymore because there was one person that was taking advantage of them. But we don't do that. So they take advantage of us. At least we loved. Love never fails. Eventually, love is going to win. It will win. Because this love comes from God. It doesn't come from my being able to do this on my own. It comes from God. Notice what it says in Romans 5.5. 5, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells within you. His nature is to love. Do you understand? His nature is to love. And so what he brings is the very love of God inside of you. It's been poured out in you. You say, I can't love this way, John. No, you can't. Like we said last week, is the Christian life is an impossible life to live. You can't live it. 
It has only been lived by one person and one person only. But in that is the saving grace, is that same person who lived that life is now living in me. I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So now, yes, I can live this way because the love of God has been poured out in my heart. I can do this. I can set my heart to love. We can set our heart to be right or we can set our heart to love. I, I remember, I just happened to see Harvey. You remember Harvey in the movie, uh, Jim Stewart? He said, he said, he said uh, his, mom, his grandma or his mother said to him, you know, you can either be right or you can be kind. He says, I tried right, but I've decided I like kind better. And I think that's, I thought that was good. That's almost exactly the same thing we're saying. He says, yeah, we can be right or we can be kind. We can be lovers of what God has done in us. We can let go of all those things, all those hard things that, have, that, a person, that causes a person to become bitter in their heart. They can get rid of those things through the love of God doesn't change necessarily the person that are harmed them, but it does change the person who is the one who loves them. It's also a command from God. You know this, John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I loved you, that you also love one another. <clears throat> Do you understand that this is a command from God? It's the only command that Jesus really gave to us, other than believe on him. Believe on him and love. Two things. We cover it all with that whole thing. All the commandments, all the, everything else that's in there. It's all covered. And Jesus says, this is the love that I have. And he gives us chapter 13 of Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians to accomplish that for us. That's what we need. But understand this, it is our mark also. How do people know that you're a believer? Because you have good theology? Paul talked to the guys in Mars Hill and they just laughed at him when he gave them good theology. He says, by this, what? By this love that you have for one another, men will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. That is the bottom line of being a Christian. Is, do I love people? Do I love them? Not do I make them twice the son of hell as me. It is, do I love them? And if they never come to Christ, will I still love them anyway? You know, when we talk to people about Jesus, we have to communicate to them that they are more important to us than the gospel. It's not true that they're more important than the gospel. The gospel is, is everything to us. But we have to convince them that they are loved by God. And the only way that we can do that is to let them know that they are important to us, extremely important to us. They're not just somebody that we can have, have, pull out our gospel gun and shoot them with the gospel and then mark off, I shared the gospel today. I shared the gospel today. I shared the gospel today. But did we love them when we shared the gospel today? It's amazing. When I was on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, I went around on the campus of University of California of Riverside, and I'd find kids, and I'd say to them, hey, I'd just like to talk to you for five minutes. And you know what I did? Is I just sat down with them when they let me do that. I sat down with them, and I asked them about themselves. That's all I did. I talked to them about themselves. And I paid attention to what they had to say. At the end of five minutes, I said, okay, thank you very much, and I got up to go. And every time I did that, they would say to me, wait, stop, what are you doing? I never had that when I came up with the gospel and tried to share the gospel. They were glad to see me go. But when I cared for them, they wanted to hear more. 
and I was able to share the gospel and I communicated the gospel. Not very many of them came to Christ the first time they talked to me, but nevertheless, they wanted to hear what was in me because I paid attention to them. Love is the way we go. Satan tells us lies. Satan can duplicate power. He can make miracles, speaking in tongues, prophecy, you name it. But he cannot duplicate the love of God. All that stuff is going to be done away with. These people were saying, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, I'm, you know, this is what I got. And he says, guys, you're not putting your time and your money into where it really lasts because this stuff is going to go away. He says, but there are, <clears throat> if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. All this stuff that you're thinking is really, really important is not very important in the long run, guys. That's the point of this passage. When people get stuck on trying to make it say things that Paul didn't intend, then we lose track of what it is that he was really talking about. It's throwing up smoke screens so you don't have to love. But here's what he says. He says, get a grip. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. When? When the perfect comes. When is that? When we see Jesus. When we see Jesus, we shall, he says, but then I will fully know just as I also I have been fully known. I will know fully. I will know this. That day, it'll be gone. All this stuff that, that God uses to encourage us with is going to be gone because we will be seeing him face to face. And as it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. That's a glorious day that's coming. That's coming to every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're a good believer or a bad believer, it doesn't make any difference. You're a believer. You believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You put your faith and trust in him, and you're moving that direction you're going to stand in his presence and you're going to be like him. It's going to be glorious. Now, goes on to say, love is the greatest. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Yeah, God has given us <coughs> faith. He's given us this hope and it is a glorious hope. It's an anchor for the soul. But what it is the thing that binds it all together is love. When Jesus Christ, before Jesus Christ came into this world, God spoke to men. And men thought of God as being this angry God who's going to judge them at the end of their life. And they'd better toe the line or else they're going to roast in hell. But Jesus came and he explained God. He showed what God is really about. And what he showed them is that God is love. That statement out of John chapter 3 is the most amazing statement that you can imagine. I remember when I first realized that the words out of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, was spoken by Jesus. It wasn't spoken about Jesus. It was spoken by Jesus. It was a red letter edition of the Bible. Sometimes those are useful. And I wrote, oh, that was spoken. I just dawned, that, Jesus said that. What is he doing? He's showing us the nature of God is love. It is not, he's not looking forward to condemning men to hell. That's not what God is looking forward to. He's looking forward to the time when he's able to usher in those who is, are his because they responded to God's love. This passage of scripture is extremely important for us. It's not just something that we give to marriage couples and says, okay, now go do it. Because they don't do it. You just don't do it. You got to live it. You got your marriage that's falling apart. So what do you do? You let it fall apart. No. You say, wait a second. 
I haven't loved with the love of Christ yet. You got a relationship with a child or, or a parent or a relative or a friend that's falling apart. What do you do? You just let it fall apart. You know, they deserve that. I'm done with that. No. I love with the love of Christ. You got a church that's falling apart. What do you do? Let it fall apart. No. I haven't loved. I haven't loved yet with the love of Christ. Let's try that first. Let's try that first. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm preaching like Paul says, as for the love of the saints, I have no need to teach you anything, for God himself teaches you to love one another. And you know, you know how to love each other. But also, I feel like he goes on to say, even so, love one another. So that's what I'm doing today. You already have this information inside of you because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. If you're a believer, he's in there. Then let's try it. Let's do that which God has done. Let's open our hearts and not be afraid of somebody taking advantage of our love. If they do so, that's their problem. They're going to have to answer to God for that. You don't have, just love people. Just love them. I can love you. Right? And you're weird. <laughs> and I'm weirder. But we can love each other. Yeah. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the blessings of the scriptures and how powerful it is to transform us. I pray that you indeed work deeply into our hearts and minds the message that you give to us in the scriptures. Not my message. That's, that's, that's nothing. But your word is something. And we need, it. we need it in our hearts and souls now. Thank you, O oh God, for being our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are the people of God. And who is Lord? Amen. I love you.